Warren Buffett calls them out as being liars, deceivers. Because as a private company, they had to pay their top people in cash, which was expense, but we could pay them in stock options and things like that, which weren't expensed or were explained as not really counting. I sort of lying about our accounting, we could add $10 million in the earning, and they wanted us to pay them because they couldn't do it and we could do it. And Welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna be doing something that I've never done before. I am calling for change. I'm endorsing a change, and I'm trying to make this video to promote a change in the generally accepted accounting principles, otherwise known as GAAP. Now, I've gone over this subject many times before, and I'm not going to belabor the points or repeat what I've said previously, but it is regarding stock-based compensation. And unfortunately, with the way that our accounting is done right now, the way the financial statements are prepared is highly misleading to investors retail investors, and even institutional investors. And in fact, in many cases, this isn't even accidental. I'll be showing in this video strong evidence of companies that are intentionally, willfully, purposefully deceiving investors, using stock-based compensation and the way that it's accounted for on the cash flow statements to intentionally deceive investors. So my purpose and intention of this video is to promote a change and the general accepted accounting principles. That change is moving stock-based compensation from an operating activity to a financing activity. That might seem like a subtle change, and if you're not familiar with the cash flow statement, you might not even know what that means. But I'm gonna explain in this video why that subtle change of more accurately accounting for stock-based compensation makes a massive difference to the way that investors perceive companies. So we have a lot to get into in this video. I think you're gonna wanna stick around. Let's go ahead and jump in. Now, the first thing I wanna do as we dive into this is make sure that we're on the same page. And if you're not an accountant and you're not good at looking at numbers, that doesn't matter. Stay with me here. This is very easy to understand. The first thing that I wanna clarify is what stock-based compensation is. There's a couple different ways of compensating employees. You can compensate them either through cash, just like a salary, or you can compensate them through shares of a company. Companies will issue shares to the employees as a form of compensation. That's stock-based compensation, otherwise called share compensation, but it's all basically the same. You're paying employees with stock in the company. And just to be clear, I have no issue with stock-based compensation. I only have an issue with the way that it's accounted for and relayed to investors. So let's go ahead and dive into an example of how this is currently accounted for. Let's go ahead and just look at an earnings report from a random company. The one that I selected this time is Netflix, but you could use any company. Now let's go ahead and scroll down to where we get to the financial statements. Companies have three different financial statements. They have the income statement, they have the balance statement, and then they have the cash flow statement. So on Netflix, we have the balance sheet. We're not looking at that one. And then we have the statement of cash flows. This is the statement that we're interested in right now. This is where we're getting deceived as investors. And in some cases, I think very intentionally. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. now. If I'm looking at the cash flow statement, there's three different categories within the cash flow statement. Let me go ahead and highlight this. We have the cash flows from operating activities. So operating activities is one part of it. Then we have the cash flows from investing activities. That's like your CapEx, your acquisitions, when the company goes out and buys something. And then you have the cash flows that the company receives from financing activities. That's like if the company finances a purchase by uh, selling shares, or if the company issues debt, that would show up as a financing activity. So just to summarize, you have the cash flow statement and you have three different activities on the cash flow statement, operating activity, investing activity, financing activity. Now what investors try to get from the cash flow statement, among other things, is the free cash flow of the company. That's one of the main metrics that investors look at. Free cash flow is a term to describe the amount of cash a company generates from its operating activities after its capital expenditures. And free cash flow is not a gap term. So it's not under gap accounting. Now, in the case of Netflix, if I was to calculate the free cash flow, all I'd be doing is I'd be going under the operating activities. I would be going right here where I get the net cash provided by the operating activities. That's 443 million. 
And then I'd take that number and I would subtract the capex of the company. So I'd subtract the purchase of property and equipment, which is $111 million. That's where I get my free cash flow from the company. So again, we have the operating activities, the cash flow from that, and then we have the purchase of property and equipment, which is the capex. Very simple. You take one number and you subtract the other. In this case, Netflix generated uh, net cash provided in operating activities of $443 million, and then they had capex of $111 million. So if I do some rough math there, they had around $330 million of free cash flow. Now let's go ahead and check that. We can pull it up on Qualtrum here. I can open up Netflix and we can go down to the free cash flow chart here. If I go over to the last quarter, which this is, it's $332 million. So that's correct. That's how we calculate free cash flow, right? And that leaves investors believing that this company generated free cash flows of $330 million. And again, this isn't just my way of calculating free cash flow. This is the way that almost every investor, generally speaking, calculates free cash flow. They take the cash from operations and they subtract the capex and you get the free cash flow. In fact, just to illustrate how broadly accepted this form of calculating free cash flow is, Netflix actually has a calculation of free cash flow on their earnings report. Look at this on page 15, Netflix has the calculations of free cash flow. And how does Netflix calculate their free cash flow? Well, they do it the exact same way that we just did. They take the net cash provided in operating activities, which was the 443 million. They subtract out the purchase of property and equipment, and then they get you that nice $332 million. So companies are reinforcing this, saying, yeah, calculate free cash flow this way. That's how much free cash flow the investor has. And again, this is deceiving. That's not really accurate. That's not how much cash flow the investor has to keep to themselves. That's not cash flows that can be returned in dividends or buybacks. So when we look at this, there's a little bit of a disconnect. The number we're getting here is oftentimes completely worthless, totally meaningless, and in some cases, actually extremely deceiving. Now to illustrate how this is so deceiving to investors, we can head right back to the cash flow statement. This is exactly what we were looking at just a minute ago. We have the same number right here. The net cash provided in operating activities, the 443 million. To arrive at this number, part of the calculation, part of what's added to this number of positive free cash flow from the operating activities is the stock-based compensation, this line item right here. And every single cash flow statement under operating activities is stock-based compensation. That is part of gap accounting. And so what they're basically doing here is saying, Netflix is saying, we generated $443 million in operating activity income. And they're adding in the $153 million as stock-based compensation. To say that another way, Netflix is basically saying what we pay employees is positive free cash flow. The $153 million that we paid employees over the past 90 days, yeah, we're including that in our free cash flow. Now, does that make any sense? Paying your employees in stock should be counted towards your operating activity income. It shouldn't. And this is what should be changed. And what I'm calling for, what I'm suggesting and encouraging should be changed in these financial statements. Instead of this being listed under operating activities, the suggested change that I'm proposing, as well as many other people that I'll mention here, is that stock-based compensation, this right here, gets moved down to a financing activity. A financing activity. Financing activities are not added into the calculation of free cash flow. So if this was moved from operating activity down to a financing activity, it wouldn't be included in it. It wouldn't bump up these numbers artificially by how much they pay employees with stock. And if you actually think about the correct categorization of stock-based compensation, this also just makes sense. Think about this. If you're deciding as a business how to fund your employee expense, how to pay for it, whether you take out debt and pay for them in cash or whether you raise money by selling shares, that is a financing decision. You're trying to decide how to finance the compensation for your employees. So it would be more accurately categorized as a financing activity and that would be far less deceiving 
to investors. It would solve two problems with one change. This is a change that needs to happen, and I hope that it will. And if you're watching this video and you're an accountant or you have any influence over gap accounting, I think that you should encourage any type of change to bring more transparency and to make it so that stock-based compensation is listed as a financing activity. And if you think that I'm naive and that these changes will never happen or nothing can change with gap accounting, Changes have happened all the time with gap accounting. The regulations are updated all the time to solve these type of specific issues, deception and abuse of the financial statements. Let me give you one example in history. We can look at the example of EAT, ticker symbol EAT, which is Brinker International. This is a company that owns Chili's. There was one change that happened in gap accounting that really changed how balance sheets looked when you looked up a balance sheet on any type of financial instrument. For example, we can bring this up on Qualtrum here. Qualtrum shows the balance sheet of every single company. So we can look at this company and we can look at the amount of cash and long-term debt the company has. All right, that's, that's what was reflected in the balance sheet of the company. And this is what investors saw when they're investing in a company like Brinker International. Let me zoom in on this because this is very, very important. You have the cash here, you have the long-term debt. So investors were looking at this quarter by quarter and going, wow, this company has a lot of long-term debt, but it's only $1.4 billion and the company makes you know X amount of EBITDA. So that's what they had portrayed to them. Well, this is actually deceptive. Companies were actually putting a lot of things that were sort of debt under a different classification called capital leases. And they could do that if it met certain metrics. And a lot of companies were intentionally, instead of taking out long-term debt, putting as much things as possible under capital leases to hide it from the balance sheet. They were doing that to cloak it, to guise it from investors. So it did not show up on tools like Qualtrim or any of your financial analysis on the company. In 2018, gap accounting rules were updated and capital leases are now reported on the balance sheet. When you look at capital leases and you factor that in, you can see the dramatic change here. All of a sudden we have a new thing represented on the balance sheet, capital leases. And all of a sudden it makes it look like this type of company has a bit more debt than you would otherwise think. Not only do they have their long-term debt, but investors might be surprised or even shocked to know they have $1.4 billion in capital leases. And capital leases in many cases are very synonymous with debt. They're long-term obligations. These are basically rental payments, or in many cases, companies can even put things like tractors and equipment under capital leases. So this is an example of an update a change, an improvement to make it so that investors are less deceived by looking at financial statements. In this case, this does bring transparency. Now, when I look at companies, I always view their capital leases because it's part of their balance sheet. It's part of their obligations and their future debt they have to pay. But before this rule was updated, I might have been none the wiser. I may have not paid attention to this and inadvertently invested in companies that had a lot more obligations than I previously would have known. So these type of changes are positive, they're needed. And this type of change with stock-based compensation is especially needed. In my opinion, it's more needed than this 2018 change with capital leases. The reason that this change is so needed is because free cash flow has become such a common term that investors use, such a common metric that they look at. And a lot of investors to this day are still being unwittingly tricked by these financial statements. For example, we can take Palantir. This is a company that a lot of investors, they dove into over the past couple of years because it was a very popular stock. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I have seen in my time over the past two years of covering this stock is a lot of investors, retail investors coming to me and saying, Joseph, I am shocked. I had no clue that this company really generated no free cash flow beyond what they pay their employees. This was surprising. They looked at the chart and they thought that this company was free cash flow positive, generating $100 million, 95, 87, 20, 56, 32. Every quarter, they're free cash flow positive. Then I show them this graph where stock based compensation is added to the free cash flow. 
When you subtract that out, this company doesn't make a dime. And investors that are investing in this type of company that have no clue about this, well, they reasonably feel like they've been deceived. And this is also becoming an increasingly big problem as stock-based compensation is becoming increasingly common. More and more companies now are paying a larger proportion of employees' salaries, their total compensation by stock, therefore hiding a major expense from investors on the cash flow statement. For example, we have companies like this, and I'm not even cherry picking here. There's so many of them that have explosive amounts of compensation through stock. We look at this company, last quarter it did $322 million in revenue, and check out the amount of stock-based compensation it issued last quarter, $154 million worth. That means that this company has stock-based comp equaling half its total revenue. So this is becoming a growing problem as more and more companies are paying employees this way. Now, the worst part about this is although some companies are just abiding by gap accounting rules, a lot of companies are taking advantage of this. They know that it's deceiving and they're intentionally using this little loophole and the way that stock-based comp is categorized to intentionally deceive investors as much as possible. I said I would share evidence of that, and I have evidence right here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this Warren Buffett clip. This is from 2019. It is a Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And this is a story of a proposal that Warren Buffett shares that relates directly to stock-based comp. The proposals we receive from the investment world, I've got to tell you about one because it, it, it uh, it illustrates go on. We received a proposition the other day, and I'll disguise the numbers a little bit so nobody uh, can pick it out. But it was a private company, and we'll say it was earning $100 million a year. But the seller of the business and the investment banker suggested that we should look at the earnings as being $110 million a year, because as a private company, they had to pay their top people in cash, which was expensed, but we could pay them in stock options and things like that, which weren't expensed or were explained as not really counting. And there- You hear what he just said? He had a private company contact him and said, we earn around a hundred million dollars. But if you buy the company, our earnings automatically go up. Because as a private company, guess what we can't do? We have no shares to issue. We're not publicly traded. We have to pay all of our employees in cash. We can't pay them in stock. But as a public company, if you, Warren Buffett, bought the company, then we could transfer how we pay employees from cash to stock, and therefore we could magically make the company earn more money. And continuing on with this, Warren Buffett calls them out as being liars, deceivers. Therefore, we would, could report $110 million if we gave away something we didn't want to give away. But by essentially by, by sort of lying about our accounting, we could add $10 million to the earning. And they wanted us to pay them because they couldn't do it. And we could do it. And therefore, at this point, they're losing me, of course, <laughs> totally. But it, it's just astounding the, the accounting games that are played. All the adjustments are why place should really be, will be earning more than before. It's, it's. He literally points out that these aren't just accounting games, they're lies. And again, this is commonplace. It goes on all the time. I see these adjustments that these companies do and the way that they try to account for things is always trying to make them look as profitable as possible. And this part with stock-based comp right now, I think is the most widely abused way of doing this. So I think it's very clear that this type of thing is being intentionally abused. Now, I also think it's clear that stock-based comp should be moved from an operating activity to a financing activity but I can't claim that I'm the only one with this idea. This is something that a lot of researchers, commentators, and other investors have supported for a long period of time. Terry Smith has also highlighted in his most recent investor letter how deceptive these accounting gimmicks are. He highlights it specifically with stock-based compensation and the cash flow statement. Many investors and analysts, including us, look at the cash flow metrics more than accrual profits. Unfortunately, Share-based compensation may cause distortions in cash flow metrics as well, even when they follow GAAP. Under GAAP, share-based compensation is added back to the cash flow from operating activities, which in turn is used in the computation of free cash flow. Some researchers and commentators argue that share-based compensation should be reclassified from the operating activity section to the financing activity section of a cash flow statement for analytical purposes. We agree. After all, 
the decision to fund compensation to employees with shares rather than cash is a financing decision rather than one pertaining to the operating of the company. I agree 100% with Terry Smith on this, and he's literally suggesting the exact same thing that I am. But Terry Smith is just one investor that is an expert in accounting and has literally wrote books called Accounting for Growth, which got CEOs fired for deceptive accounting practices. But what could he possibly know about the subject, right? If you don't trust Terry Smith's opinion on it, you don't trust my opinion on it, let's go ahead and go to someone else. We have research here from Morgan Stanley's Michael Malbison, who I think is, is literally a genius when it comes to these type of things. His research is incredibly good, and I suggest anybody read his, his ongoing research on a different topics. Here's a research paper he came out with October 6, 2022, called Return on Invested Capital. In this research paper, Michael Malbison addresses free cash flow in the way that it's being accounted for right now. Stock-based compensation is added back to calculate cash flow from operating activities. This means that a potentially significant expense is ignored. Stock-based compensation, really a form of financing, can be a considerable contributor to cash flow from operating activities, in some cases exceeding 100%. That's exactly the case in Palantir and Unity and so many other companies, which is completely ignored. But we have researchers, we have investors, we have many accountants, we have many people agreeing that stock-based compensation is really a form of financing. And by categorizing it that way, it does not give companies this free reign to abuse this metric and trick investors. Now, the last thing that I'll point out is a summary of recommended adjustments from CounterPoint Global. They say stock-based compensation on the cash flow statement should be moved from cash flow from operating activities to cash flow from financing activities. The rationale, stock-based compensation is the sale of shares to pay employees. Therefore, it is a financing activity. So there's many people already supporting this change, and I just wanted to throw in my voice as well that I think this is something that would really benefit a lot of people to have updated. Now, in the meantime, I wanted to just show what I'm doing in the meantime with Qualtrum to, to kind of put these rules into play as if it's already happening. I have the free cash flow here, and then you can see the stock-based compensation next to it, but I'm gonna make another chart, which is basically what this would look like if the accounting was already done correctly, if stock-based comp was a financing activity. And that will show these two numbers netted out, what the company would be making in free cash flow if stock-based comp was treated as a financing activity. So that will be in the next version of Qualtrum. I think that will clear up companies. It'll show you their true free cash flows. It'll show you their true free cash flow yields. And it will make it so you can do analysis normalized for companies that pay a lot in stock and companies that don't. So I think that will be a good change as well. But that's all this video is about. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. I'll see you in the next one.